This Sunday, next stage. Israel expands its ground operation in Gaza as President Biden pushes for a humanitarian pause. The Israelis should be incredibly careful. Concerns also grow for a widening war as the U.S. strikes back at Iranian-linked targets after U.S. forces in the Mideast come under multiple attacks. Plus, Mr. Speaker, the House finally elects a speaker. Louisiana's Mike Johnson ending weeks of chaos. The People's House is back in business. And just hours later, the deadliest mass shooting this year, where 18 were killed in Lewiston, Maine. The speaker's response, guns are not to blame. The problem is the human heart. It's not guns, it's not the weapons. And trail mix. President Biden has a new primary challenger, Minnesota Congressman Dean Phillips. I'm running because America is demanding it. While former Vice President Mike Pence drops out of the 2024 race. It's become clear to me, this is not my time. My guest this morning, Florida Governor and 2024 Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis, Democratic Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal of Washington State, and former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, Tulu Olorunipa, White House bureau chief for The Washington Post, former White House press secretary Jen Psaki, and Stephen Hayes, editor of The Dispatch. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Kristen Welker. Good Sunday morning. The nation is reeling after a week which saw the 10th deadliest mass shooting in modern American history, with 18 people between 14 and 76 years old gunned down at a bowling alley and bar in Lewiston, Maine. The election finally of a new Speaker of the House, Louisiana Congressman Mike Johnson, after weeks of Republican infighting. The end of former Vice President Pence's campaign for the White House further solidifying former President Donald Trump's hold on the Republican Party. But we begin this morning with the war between Israel and Hamas, which has entered its next stage. On Saturday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israeli forces had entered the Gaza Strip on Friday, beginning the second stage of the war, but he avoided calling the campaign an invasion. The escalation has intensified domestic pressure on Israel's government to secure the release of the 230 hostages seized in the October 7th attack. Netanyahu met with family members on Saturday. For its part, the U.S. carried out airstrikes on a weapons and ammunition storage area in eastern Syria on Friday in retaliation for recent rocket and drone attacks on American forces in Iraq and Syria. Here's Prime Minister Netanyahu. Our fight inside the Gaza Strip will be long and difficult, but we are prepared for that. This is our second war of independence. We will fight for the protection of our homeland. Joining me now is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a Republican candidate for president. Governor DeSantis, welcome to Meet the Press. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I want to dive right in and start with Israel, what Israel is calling this next phase of the war. If you were president right now, Governor, would you urge Israel to slow its current offensive to allow for the release of more hostages and for more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza? I would support Israel's right to end this problem once and for all. Obviously, we have an interest in the hostages being rescued. I would work with them. I would look at the intelligence to see what our options are there. And, of course, we have a strong interest there. Uh, But Israel is facing an enemy that wants nothing less than another Holocaust. Uh, They would eliminate Israel from the map if they could. Hamas would drive every Jew into the sea. So I think it's important for the United States, one of our strongest allies, that we stand with them publicly and privately, in word and in deed, because I think if they do anything else than uh, eliminate Hamas entirely, they're just going to face these types of attacks again in the future. Governor, if you were president, though, what would your message be to Israel in terms of defending itself, but also trying to mitigate civilian deaths, which are already estimated to be in the thousands? 
Well, on the humanitarian aid, uh, I've not been supportive of sending that to the Gaza Strip simply because Hamas will commandeer that money. And if you look at what Israel's facing now with dealing with Hamas, Hamas, there's been a lot of money that's gone to the Gaza Strip for humanitarian purposes since Hamas took power. Did they use that money to make life better for the people in the Gaza Strip? No, they used it to build a massive terrorist infrastructure. They have elaborate tunnels. They have all these things put in place that they've used to launch rocket attacks for many, many years and, of course, uh, launch the barbaric attack uh, on October 7th. So Hamas is the problem here. And I think Israel's taken great pains to warn people uh, to get out if you're a civilian casualty. Hamas takes great pains to try to get them to stay so that they can use them as human shields. Understood your point that Hamas is hoarding some of that aid material, but aid organizations say some of the aid that has been recently sent in has made its way to civilians. My question to you, though, is how much of a priority would it be if you were president to try to limit civilian deaths, Governor? Well, any time you're involved in, in military conflict, you want to be able to achieve decisively the military objective with minimizing damage to civilians and, and, and civilian infrastructure as much as possible. So, so that goes without saying. But I think it's a double standard here when Hamas can go in and massacre babies, massacre elderly people, rape and mutilate. And it's almost like, actually, you have people in the United States that are that are siding with Hamas in the streets and cheering that. You don't hear much there. But then all of a sudden now it's Israel is under the microscope for everything they do. Hamas can end this by releasing the hostages and unconditionally surrendering. So they are choosing to put people through this. Uh, there's no way that they can do what they did and not expect uh, to have a, a very, very severe response. Well, let me ask you about some of the statements that you have made recently about those protesters. This week, you called for the banning of pro-Palestinian groups from Florida State Colleges. Your Republican challenger, Vivek Ramaswamy, says that violates the First Amendment rights of these students. He writes, quote, it's a shameful political ploy it's unconstitutional. It's utter hypocrisy for someone who railed against left wing cancel culture. What is your response to Mr. Ramaswamy? This is not cancel culture. Uh, this group, they themselves said in the aftermath of the Hamas attack that they don't just stand in solidarity, that they are part uh, of this Hamas movement. And so, yeah, you have a right to go out and demonstrate, but you can't provide material support to terrorism. They've linked themselves to Hamas. And so we absolutely decertified them. Uh, they should not get one red cent of taxpayer dollars. Uh, and we also have strong laws in Florida against fundraising for groups like Hamas. And we are enforcing those vigorously. It's not a First Amendment issue. That's a material support to terrorism issue. Yeah, just to be clear, you're citing the Florida law that says one cannot give material aid or resources to a terrorist organization. Do you have any support that they're actually doing that? Their own words are saying they're part of this organization, that they don't just stand in solidarity, that they don't just support what they did, but that this is their movement, too. So once you hit your wagon to a group like Hamas, uh, that takes you out of the realm uh, of normal activity. And that's something that, that we're going to take action against. So we believe we're totally justified within the law. Um, and I think things like this have been litigated time and again. But here's the, here's the broader point. You know, are we just going to uh, commit suicide as a country um, and let groups metastasize who are openly siding with brutal terrorist organizations? I don't think that's a recipe for a successful country. Uh, I want to have a country where we're protected from that stuff. Yeah. So I think we made the right decision. I stand by it 100%. You take me to my next question. The only Republican Jewish state representative in Florida, Randy Fine, recently broke from you in an op-ed in the Washington Times. He says you haven't been nearly as vocal in opposing neo-Nazi harassment and attacks in your state as you have in opposing what you believe support for Hamas, which you just laid out. What's your response to that, what he's accusing you of, this hypocrisy effectively? 
Well, he's just uh, trying to get his 15 minutes of fame. I mean, this guy was singing my praises a couple of months ago. He's got his uh, different reasons why he's doing that. Uh, we have acted very, very swiftly and decisively. I mean, for example, after this attack, we dispatched state law enforcement working in conjunction with locals uh, to protect our Jewish institutions, our Jewish day schools, our synagogues. Uh, there have been arrests that have been made with people that were uh, threatening to do harm to our Jewish community. Uh, and we have some of the strongest laws on the book from anti-BDS uh, to financial support for, for security of anywhere in the country. We're also one of the states that's had probably the most uh, in migration uh, of Jewish yep. residents. And we have the second highest Israeli American population in the entire country. So people vote with their feet. They see the type of yep. environment we've created here that's been very strong yep. and positive. And name me, Kristen, another governor who scrambled planes to Israel to but bring Governor them back, bring Americans back from the war zone. We did that. We got that job done. Almost 700 people we've, re we've rescued, and we're proud of stepping up and leading on that. Governor, let me ask you, though, because as you know, words also matter. You are the governor. You are a presidential candidate. Your state has heard from both Marco Rubio and Rick Scott condemning those neo-Nazi protests. Why didn't you speak out? Why didn't you use your voice to say that you're not going to stand for that? Of course we condemn that. I mean, that's you just look at everything that we've done in but terms of our policies. But uh, you didn't at the time, Governor. You didn't at the time, according to Randy Fine. According to Randy Fine, you did not at the time. Well, right, and he and he and he's and he's and he's just trying to create a, a name for himself. So that's all nonsense. Everybody knows that's nonsense. Um, and don't give somebody a 15 minutes of fame just because they're letting you try to uh, to do a preferred narrative uh, just to hit me. It's nonsense. Uh, our record is second to none, and we'll continue to lead on these issues. Let's turn to another key domestic issue, the horrific mass shooting in Maine. And I want to get your reaction to what the newly elected Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson had to say about it this week. He said, quote, at the end of the day, the problem is the human heart. It's not guns. Do you agree with him? Well, first of all, I think this was a, a very tragic thing. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to all the victims in this truly horrific uh, I think in this case, there was a medical intervention, a health health intervention. He clearly had problems. He was involuntarily committed. Uh, he would not have been somebody that would have been a prohibited possessor, or he would have been a prohibited possessor uh, based on that adjudication. So this is, I think, an example where clearly this is a guy very well trained, had a lot of skills, and then went off his rocker. There was an intervention, but there it wasn't enough. So I'd like to know why wasn't there more done? We've seen instances throughout the country where there have been a lot of signs where people have maybe been referred, but then they don't go through with, with everything. And I think that's going to be probably what we end up finding out here. I, I'm somebody that said publicly uh, we've had a major push over the last 40, 50 years for yeah. deinstitutionalization of people. And I'm not saying you got to go all the way back, but I do think that we tend to pass the buck with some of these people and just kind of hope that they don't do anything wrong when there's a lot of signs. Uh, so I would be more aggressive on some of those fringe people yeah. uh, who clearly are demonstrating signs that they're a major danger to, to society. Let me ask you about your call to institutionalize people, though, because we are learning new details about what did and did not happen. This is overnight. Law enforcement chiefs say they received a statewide alert in mid-September to be on the lookout for Card after he made threats against his base, against his fellow soldiers. They searched for him. They could not find him, yet he was able to, in the days before the attack, walk into a store and buy guns. So if you can't find someone to institutionalize them, as you have called for, why shouldn't there be a final line of defense in the form of a red flag law or some other blaring red sign that says to gun sellers, don't allow this person to have a gun? Well, I don't think you would even need a red flag. If somebody has a, a mental a involuntary commitment uh, and adjudication of, of that nature, uh, that usually would go into the system, and that would be on a traditional background check. I mean, uh, I, I believe in due process, so I don't believe in this idea, you know, that the government can just take someone's property and then go through due process later. Uh, but what I do believe is convicted felons and people that are mentally uh, incompetent or mentally ill, I think that's been the 
law in pretty much every state and federally for quite some time. And, um, and you know, I believe in strong, strong constitutional rights, but with that comes responsibility. And if you're somebody that, that is not, that can't conduct themselves in society because of mental illness, uh, then that absolutely should be taken into account. But if you can't conduct yourself in terms of mental illness, shouldn't there be a law in this case Officials in Maine are saying a red flag law could have made a difference. It would have empowered authorities to raise that red light to gun sellers all across the state and say, this is someone who should not be able to own a gun, that that final line of defense never kicked in because it didn't exist, Governor. Well, no, when you do background checks, if somebody has a criminal conviction, for example, that goes into the system. When the they run a background, background check, background that is what check. they're checking. Again. Maine doesn't have strong background checks. No. Are you arguing for it, that? It's no. Every, every federal, every federal, there, uh, this is a fe federal firearm licenses. When you have to do you, everyone has to go through where they where they scrub this. So the question is, is what are you putting into the system? If somebody has a mental health involuntary commitment, then that can simply be put into the existing mm -hmm. system. You don't need additional uh, things. And here's the problem I have with, with some of the proposals that have been done, and particularly in some of the more blue states, is that will be weaponized uh, against people that the government doesn't like. I mean, you have a situation where someone can just make an anonymous call into uh, a police station, let's say, say, so, say something bad about someone. But that and anonymous then they come call in could have take, helped in this firearms. moment. Could it not have, Governor? Could an anonymous call have helped in this moment to block this shooter from getting a gun and going into these establishments and shooting up 18 of his fellow citizens? And he could have had that involuntary commitment just put into the normal system. That is something that, that would have been able to, to pop on the on a background check to then how say that people should just be able to find, call. Governor, how can you commit someone you can't find? When you have an involuntary commitment, uh, that triggers uh, 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 things to go into a background check system. So, so that should have been enough if those if that information was put into it. So that's what I would do. I would focus on on those individuals who've actually gone and either been involuntary committed, been adjudicated uh, to be meant to be mentally ill. That that's really the approach that matters. And uh, I think you can look, you know, in Florida. Uh, our crime rates at a 50 year low and our violent crime rates down 30 uh, percent since I've been governor. So so we're handling it strong. Governor, actually, statistically speaking, the CDC says that the firearm mortality rate is actually higher under your administration than it was under your predecessor's administration. But I do want to move on to the campaign the, and just the what mortality your, rate. No, no. The firearm mortality rate. Well, I don't, but I, was actually no, higher that, well, under first your of all, administration I mean, we, than your predecessors. We, that's according to the CDC. Let me because, move on to the campaign. Governor. Well, right, be, because of, well, because you had COVID and all that stuff. Excess mortality is that what you're saying? That went up everywhere in the country uh, from 2020 on. No, Our excess mortality, mortality went up rate, less Governor, the fire than mortality. anybody. The firearm mortality rate. Let me move on well, though to uh, the campaign because I want to let you respond to the state of the race right now. Governor, and as you know, you are trailing double digits behind former President Trump. He is facing 91 felony counts. Do you believe that the former president's legal troubles are the reason that you're still in this race? No, I mean, I think that had Alvin Bragg not politicized this back in April, I think the pri probably the primary would be looking different. I mean, I think that that uh, gave uh, gave the former president more support. I think people felt uh, that he was treating being treated unfairly, which he was in that circumstance. I mean, that that I think has been a, a very important inflection point in this uh, because it, it highlights the weaponization of justice by some of these left wing prosecutors. But here's the thing. Ultimately, uh, it's not about the past. It's not about all these other uh, issues. It's ultimately about how do you get in and reverse the country's decline? How do we get the country back on a strong plane so that we lower prices for people, get the border secured, uh, deal with crime in the inner cities? And, and we need a strong leader to be able to do that, someone that can win uh, and someone that can actually bring this in. So that's the message that we're bringing to people in Iowa, New Hampshire. And, you know, when you're on the ground, you see the, the support building. Uh, we're doing what we need to do uh, to be able to get the job done. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Governor DeSantis, we will see you on the debate stage in Miami. We'll continue the conversation. Very much appreciate it. Thank you.
When we come back, the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Democratic Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal of Washington State, joins me next. Welcome back. As Israel expands its ground operation in Gaza over the weekend in Las Vegas, Republican presidential candidates declared their support for Israel. But the party's divide between isolationism and intervention was also on display. If Israel wants to at long last abandon the myth of a two-state solution, Israel should go ahead and abandon a two-state solution. The world is on fire. But here in America, we're acting like it's September 10th, when we were blind to the world's dangers. We need to remember what it felt like on September 12th. America has to get this right. I believe it's closer than ever to World War III. And I will stop World War III. You will not have World War III. On Friday, hundreds of protesters filled Grand Central Station in New York, calling for a ceasefire in the war. And on Saturday, protesters marched across the Brooklyn Bridge, the latest in a string of protests. Joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal of Washington State, who chairs the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Congresswoman Jayapal, welcome to Meet the Press. Thank you so much, Kristen. It's great to be with you. It is great to have you on a very busy Sunday. So let's begin with Israel. You have called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Do you believe there's a non-military solution to the crisis that would neutralize the terror threat from Hamas and also bring home the hostages? Well, Kristen, I called for a ceasefire or at minimum a cessation of hostilities about 12 days ago. And in that time, since the beginning of, of this horrific horrific war, um, what we have seen is now, in addition to the 1,400 Israelis who were killed, in addition to the hostages that have been taken, hundreds of hostages that have been taken by Hamas, what we are now seeing is 8,000 Palestinians who have been killed by Israeli airstrikes, 3,000 of whom are children. We have watched 120 premature babies who are likely to die without the fuel to run their incubators. And we see 50,000 pregnant women mm -hmm. in Gaza who are going to either have to deliver their babies or die, but about 150 babies being delivered every day without food, water, or fuel. This is not a situation that is going to help either advance our long-term strategic goals of taking out Hamas, of ensuring security and peace for both Israelis and Palestinians, or frankly, our ability to hold our moral authority on the world stage by ensuring that Israel follows the international humanitarian laws or the laws of war as, as President Biden has called for. Congresswoman, as the New York Times points out today, Hamas is actually sitting on a lot of that fuel, food and aid that you reference, their headquarters is underneath that hospital there. So ultimately, they are the ones who are depriving the civilians of Gaza of all of those necessary aid items that you referenced. If there were to be a ceasefire, what's the guarantee that Hamas would abide by it, Congresswoman? Well, look, Kristen, first of all, um, nobody has any love for Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization that has deprived the Palestinian people absolutely of uh, many, many things in the time of their rule. And let's not forget that the last election where Hamas was elected was 16 years ago. Half of Palestinians are children. They were not part of that. And Hamas is not Palestinians, and pa Palestinians are not Hamas. We have to be very clear about that. But humanitarian agencies have been sending aid through approved partners. And before October 7th, it was about 500 trucks per day. Now, Kristen, since the beginning of this war, we have seen less than 100 trucks delivered. Israel has stopped the fuel from coming in um, and being delivered by trusted partners. And Kristen, I just think we have to recognize that this is a double standard. The United States rightly called out Russia for its siege of Ukraine. 
rightly called out the attacks on the power infrastructure, the refusal to provide food and water and fuel to the Ukrainians. And we have to recognize that our credibility and our authority on the moral stage is, is greatly diminished if we do not also call out these, uh, this siege that Israel is launching on Gaza as violations of international Con law. We are losing credibility, and frankly, we're being isolated in the rest of the world. Let me ask you about what some of your fellow Democrats are saying. Senator John Fetterman, a fellow progressive, said, quote, now is not the time to talk about a ceasefire. He added, quote, Hamas does not want peace. They want to destroy Israel. We can talk about a ceasefire after Hamas is neutralized. Going back to that original question, how do you neutralize Hamas? What's your response to your... To Senator Fetterman. My, my, response, my response is that we need immediate, sustained humanitarian aid to flow into Gaza. We need the bombings, and you know, you can call it a humanitarian truce, uh, as 140 countries uh, said in the resolution that was passed at the United Nations. The United States was one of only 14 countries to oppose that resolution. Call it a humanitarian truce. Use that time to make sure we get the hostages out, both American hostages and Israeli hostages. Let's not forget, Kristen, that we also have 500 U.S. citizens plus their families who were told to go to southern Gaza because they were not safe yeah. in northern Gaza. That was the part that was going to be bombed. They are now at the Rafah crossing. And all these days later, three weeks later, they are still there. The United yeah. States has a responsibility to de-escalate the situation. Yeah. We see the escalation on Congress the northern border uh, with Hezbollah. And yeah. I think this is the moment for us to de-escalate, yeah. to call Let's for a cessation of hostilities, and to allow humanitarian aid through and the negotiators to work Let to get the hostages released. Let me ask you about some of your comments. You have characterized Israel as a, quote, racist state. After a backlash, you clarified that you don't believe the existence of Israel is racist, but that the government engages in racist policies. Can you explain clearly what do you mean by that, Congresswoman? Well, Kristen, I clarified this right away, not after a backlash, within 12 hours of making the statement. I clarified that what I meant is that the existence of Israel is absolutely legitimate, and I think the world has come to see it as legitimate. However, there are racists within the Netanyahu government, and there are racist policies that Israel has been carrying out. I think it is important for us to recognize that we need to be able to criticize the policies of the Israeli government and uh, and not be called anti-Semitic. I, I really believe that conversation is changing in a way that is not helpful. And let me say this too, yeah. that at the end of the day, the, the president and the United States is absolutely uh, responsible because we also have been the largest military backer of aid to Israel. Yeah. We need to be able to question where U.S. taxpayer dollars are going and what accountability the United States has in ensuring, for example, that when the president calls for Israel to uh, adhere to the international yeah. laws of war, that they actually are doing that. Otherwise, we are complicit in a way that almost no other country in the world is. Congresswoman, let me ask you about some developments surrounding President Biden this week. One, we spoke to um, leaders in Michigan who said they were concerned that he is losing support among Arab and Palestinian citizens there because of his full-throated support in Israel. That also came against the backdrop of Congressman Dean Phillips announcing he is running against President Biden. Are you concerned that in a general election, both of these things could weaken President Biden's chances? Well, let me say, Kristen, that I have been one of President Biden's biggest supporters. I've been proud to be a partner as he has been courageous and strong on the domestic front. He has really called out the injustices for average working Americans across this country. But He's is he going to be weakened, Congresswoman, with, with this? Workers. Will he be weakened with this primary challenge? Well, I feel like I need to challenge? say this because, because what I think is that the president needs 
to be just as courageous on this issue so that we keep the unity within our country for the support of the incredible things he has done. He is, I think, um, you know, going to be challenged to explain uh, an issue of this moral significance to people. The American people are actually quite far away from where uh, the president and even Congress, the majority of Congress, has been on Israel and Gaza. They, they support the right for Israel to defend itself, to exist, but they do not support a war crime exchange for another war crime. And I think the president has to be careful about that. And I would call him, because I know him well, I've had uh, breakfast with him, I've had the honor of working with him, I would call him to bring us to a higher place, to let the American people, uh, to, to really call to the American people on a moral issue of this nature. And then I think we can go forward and talk about the incredible things that he has done. But I am certainly concerned about his approach to this. And listen, my colleague, Dean Phillips, everyone's got the right to run, but I'm sorry, I have no idea what he is running on that is different from what President Biden is running on. He took the same bold stances that President Biden has taken in this country on domestic issues, and I, I really don't see what, what he's doing. That's not the point for me. The point is, right. I want President Biden to be the next president, and he needs to call us to a higher moral place. All right. Congresswoman Jayapal, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. We covered a lot of ground here. When we come back, after three weeks without a leader, House Republicans choose a new speaker, Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana, with another government shutdown looming and an urgent request to fund two wars. How will he confront those challenges? The panel is next. Welcome back. The panel is here. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, Tulu Olurunipa, White House bureau chief for The Washington Post, Stephen Hayes, editor of The Dispatch, and Jen Psaki, former White House press secretary and host of Inside with Jen Psaki. Thanks to all of you for being here. A lot of ground to cover on this Sunday. Yes. Kelly O, let me start with you and where I left off with Congresswoman Jayapal, the fact that President Biden now has a challenger in this race, Dean Phillips. He's basically, he says it's time to pass the torch. How is President Biden responding? How's the Biden campaign responding? Well, Kristen, talking with Biden allies about this, they want to very quickly embrace the impulse to just reject Dean Phillips, to say it is irrelevant and that he doesn't have any Democrats with him. We heard that in your interview and that his access to the ballot is even challenging. Mm. What they don't easily dismiss is the fact that he is, uh, regardless of his own candidacy, he is a vehicle giving a voice to what many voters feel. And that is this concern, this anxiety about a president who will be 81 in three weeks. And so that is a challenge. Uh, they will say the Biden uh, world that doesn't change the fact. Mm. That's an immutable, immutable fact. And so what they want to do is try and turn and bring the focus to the things the Democrats care a great deal about. Fear of Trump returning, certainly issues like abortion, other things that are pocketbook issues, they want to drive the attention there. And, you know, Dean Phillips is someone who's not going to seek advice from the White House because he's the grandson of Dear Abby and is not going to be looking there for any cues. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a very good point, Kelly O'Donnell, a good fact there. Tulu, let me kind of pick up on where Kelly left off in the historical context of this. If you look back in time, Historically speaking, presidents who get primary challengers, and here you have it, uh, Gerald Ford to Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, Ted Kennedy, George H.W. Bush, Pat Buchanan, mm -hmm. all went on to lose. This might, this must be giving Democrats some jitters. They will never say that publicly, um, yes. but you also think about Lyndon Johnson, 1968, who mm -hmm. faced a pretty significant challenge from Eugene McCarthy uh, in New Hampshire, uh, one with less than 50% of the vote. We have another New Hampshire situation with Dean Phillips focusing his attention there. Now, the White House will never tell you that, you know, they're worried or they're concerned. They'll focus on the fact that Dean Phillips uh, has voted with President Biden 100 percent of the time. 
But the fact that he's in this race now means that the White House, the Biden campaign, are going to be spending less time talking about the things they want to be talking about. The 4.9% GDP growth last month, the fact that unemployment is under 4%, lower than GDP growth, which hardly ever happens. And they're mm -hmm. going to have to be spending more time talking about things like the president's age, talking about things like the high cost of living, all the things that Dean Phillips is talking about in his campaign. And Representative Jayapal saying, you know, what is the difference? I think he's going to be spending a lot of time talking about the, dif the difference between him and President Biden, and that's going to be a difficult message you, for Biden. You set me up perfectly because I had a chance to talk to Dean Phillips. Let me play a little clip of that. Jen, I'm going to get your reaction on the other side. I'm not running against President Biden. I'm running for the majority of Americans who want somebody different. But you just announced uh, you're running for president, aren't you? That means you're running against President Biden. That's I'm literally the definition it, of what that and means. And I'm doing it, and I'm running for president because America deserves to have someone listen to them. Jen, what do you make of that message? Will it fly? Now, he says, look, mm -hmm. a border is an area where he sees a difference between himself and President Biden. But he's basically saying, I'm not running against him. I'm running this positive message. Well, look, I think it remains to be seen if there's Dean Mentum in this uh, campaign. <laughs> I don't think we see it quite yet. But I, I think a lot of the Democrats I talk to will, will say that if this were actually an existential crisis in the Democratic Party, if people were all trying to run away from Biden, you would have a Governor Newsom, a Governor mm. Whitmer, um, um, a governor, Wes Moore, running. They're not. Uh, Dean Phillips is not well known. If you're running for president, this is a kind of a strange campaign strategy to put all of your bets in New Hampshire where they're not awarding delegates, where there's not a diverse electorate, which, why, by the way, is the base of the Democratic Party. So, But you still have to be conscious of every factor when you're running for president. And they certainly are. They certainly are in this moment. Steve, he's got a math problem, as Jen points out, and a message challenge, yeah. right? I mean, is he running for a younger version of President Biden? Could that resonate and chip away at support in a general. Well, I would say you shouldn't start your campaign by saying you're not running against the person you're running against. <laughs> That's a problem <laughs> on, on the messages. But look, the, the, I think the, the challenge for the Biden White House, the Biden campaign, he speaks for a lot of Democrats. In our own NBC poll last month, six in 10 Democrats said that they wanted a challenger to Joe mm. Biden. 74% of registered voters say that they want Joe Biden to be challenged. Yeah. They're not comfortable with him. He's speaking for some voters, and it's a problem. We've got 53 weeks to the election, to the general election next year. Joe Biden does make mistakes. You don't have to be sort of Sean Hannity and create some big conspiracy about Joe Biden's mental yeah. capabilities. It's a, it's a problem, and people are going to see more of it, not less of it, in the next year. Major test right now for President Biden. He's asking for this new aid package, mm -hmm. Jen, from Congress. And the newly minted House Speaker, Mike Johnson, is at the helm, deeply conservative, Will he be able to work with Democrats? Well, he wants to separate the aid packages, Mike Johnson, according to reports, which is very difficult. The whole point in combining them is to get them both through. He's going to have pushback within his own caucus, Mike Johnson is. So that makes it difficult for President Biden. Also makes it difficult for Mike Johnson to work and keep the caucus together. What are you hearing, Kelly? What's the strategy in the White House to try to work? Is there one? Will there they? is one, and it is to give him a little bit of time uh, to try to see can he demonstrate leadership. One of the things that stands out about Speaker Johnson is there's no track record of leadership, mm. never ran a committee. He doesn't have the baggage of some of his predecessors of broken promises and things. That question about splitting the aid is essential because people who know how legislation gets done recognize that fusing those two priorities together is the best way to get Ukraine aid over uh, the line. And where I think Johnson has a moment here is that he, he has all the MAGA views without the bluster, without the bravado. And maybe there's a chance to have things calm down for a moment. Yeah, Tulu, what do you think about this? Will there be a grace period, a honeymoon period, where Republicans and Democrats say, let's give him a chance to try to work across the aisle? It does seem like there's a grace period at the moment. It remains to be seen how long that will be. Conservatives in the House are saying that Johnson can push forward a continuing resolution to keep the government open next month. That was what essentially led to Speaker McCarthy getting tossed out of office. So the fact that he has that grace is something that he can hold on to. But after that, what happens? What happens when we get to January or April and we have to fund the government and the same issues that McCarthy faced are going to be the same issues that Johnson faces with an ultra-conservative yeah. right wing that's willing to when take When he needs Democrats, right? Exactly. Sure. Steve, very quickly, you've been talking to Republicans. The mood? Talk to a lot of Republicans in the House. There's a lot of, I think, willingness to give him some flexibility ability, give them the room to maneuver that he needs. They don't want to go through what they've just gone through over the past three weeks. Yeah, they certainly don't. That's for sure. All right, guys, thank you so much. We covered a lot of ground here. And when we come back, a closer look at a key lawmaker who pushed for an assault weapons ban in Congress and what motivated her to fight the gun lobby.
Welcome back. California Senator Dianne Feinstein, who passed away last month at age 90, was a fierce advocate for gun control, shaped by the 1978 assassinations of San Francisco Supervisor Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone. In her first year in the Senate, Feinstein authored an assault weapons ban, which was signed into law in 1994. It remained in place until it expired in 2004. Eight years later, in the wake of more mass shootings, Senator Feinstein described how she was still determined to revive the legislation. What makes you think it can pass now? <clears throat> We've had tragedies before and nothing happens. Well, I'll tell you what happened back in 93 when I told Joe Biden, who was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, that I was going to move this as an amendment on the crime bill. He laughed at me. He said, you're new here. Wait till you learn. And uh, we got it through the Senate. We got it through the House. The White House came alive in the House of Representatives and the Clinton administration helped. The bill was passed and the president signed it. It can be done. When we come back, Arnold Schwarzenegger tells me he wishes he could run for president. Welcome back. Arnold Schwarzenegger is constantly reinventing himself. Now the world famous bodybuilder, iconic action star and two term Republican governor of California has added a new role to the list self-help author with a new book, Be Useful, Seven Tools for Life. I sat down with Schwarzenegger and asked him about the book, his improbable political career, and who he'd like to see in the White House. Governor Schwarzenegger, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thank you. I want to read you a passage of your book because one of the things that I found so fascinating about this is that you give very practical advice, including how you should think about 24 hours of every day. You write, rest is for babies and relaxation is for retired people. Why do you think it was so important for you to give this very blunt advice? Well, because I feel like we have only one life. And... Uh... We have to go and live this life fully. It's not a dress rehearsal. It's, a, it's the real thing. So let's go all out. And they, I just feel like when people say, are you going to retire? I said, look, when I'm six feet under, <laughs> then I can rest and retire and do all of that stuff. I say, as long as I'm above the grass, I want to fight. I want to be hungry. I want to struggle. I want to be useful. And uh, to me now, this is very important to combine all of my careers together into one and to make this a better world. Divisions in this country are deeper than we have seen in quite some time. What do you think the state of our democracy is? Well, you know, I always felt, uh, ever since I came to America and I started really getting into learning about the history of America and about democracy and the political system here, and uh, all of that, that democracy is, uh, is very vulnerable. And uh, that's why I always say to people, it's not a bystander sport. <laughs> you know, you got to participate. Because of the divisions in this country right now, what's the root of the vulnerability? I think it's always been vulnerable. I mean, don't forget that when I came over to America in the 60s, there was President Kennedy was assassinated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, there was violence beyond belief uh, at the Democratic Convention in Chicago, where people were clubbed to death and attacked and all of that stuff uh, by the police. And there, were the, there was the Vietnam War, there was wars going on. Uh, so, I mean, there was total madness and somehow and there was Watergate right after that. So somehow we came out of all that because there was a leader that was sane and that showed great leadership, which was Ronald Reagan. Not that he was because he was a Republican or because he was this or that or from California. It was just he was the right man to bring people together during this, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, big problem that the United States went through with the inflation rate high, the business went down, the economy went down, the stock market went down, everything went down and we, our image was horrible worldwide. 
and he brought it back. I think this is what we need. We just don't know yet who is this person that could do that. You don't know who that leader I, I, is. You I, don't I, I see that you, leader right now. Uh, because, you know, the Democrats are screaming that it has to be Biden and the Republicans are screaming it has to be Trump and all that stuff. Okay, let that playbook, uh, let that kind of thing play out again uh, so we know once and for all who the people really choose. That's perfectly fine with me, but we got to think beyond that. Mm because we need a new generation of leaders that are willing to spend as much energy as possible or as much energy as it takes to bring both of the parties together. Because we as a nation are Democrats and Republicans and independents. I want to get your take on the race for the White House, if I can. You've been very critical of former President Trump. Is there any candidate in that field who you feel like could bring the type of leadership that's needed right now? Well, you know, I don't think we give those people enough chance because it's all Trump, 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 Biden, Biden, Biden. So, I mean, so these are the things that the press talks about. Who do you so, think stands out? Well, I, you know, I, uh, I think that Joe Manchin is one of them that I think stands out because he's kind of like a center guy. He comes from an energy state, but he's a Democrat, so he knows the challenges uh, and, and all that. So, But he's one of the guys that I think is really a, a great force. But there's many others. We just have to give in general, without endorsing anybody, I think we have to give people a chance to emerge. You have said you would run for president if you could. Do you think you would be a better president than any of the candidates running right now? You know, I think that I have the ability of bringing people together. I have the ability of talking about issues without villainizing the other side. Because there's people that think differently than I do. But they're not evil. They're not terrible people. You know, they're, they're good people that mean well. So therefore, I would say it's, it, uh, we have to be able to bring people together and let everyone know they are very important to be part of the team and for us to be successful. Does it frustrate you that you can't run for the nation's highest office? No, because uh, I tell you, I have accomplished everything that I did because of America. So why would I be frustrated and angry about something, the one thing that I can't do. There's the only one thing that I can't do in America, which is run for president. Mm -hmm. Why would I be upset about that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to run for president. I would love to have the opportunity to do that and to show America that we can come together and to do the kind of things that Ronald Reagan did. Uh, but that's not the case. Do you still feel at home in the Republican Party? Absolutely. When I go up to Capitol Hill, and I meet with my Republican colleagues, I have a great time meeting with them and talking about the environment and talking about the important issues and all that stuff. I don't look at them as kind of crazy like some people do. There's some people that are extreme, mm -hmm. but there's no reason to villainize anybody. My conversation with Governor Schwarzenegger. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.